Good morning. Thank you for being with us again for today's Bible study. We are all of us experiencing a whole lot of family togetherness. And I can tell you that's a blessing, but it can also be a curse. Years ago, our church went through something called B90, which was a program where we read the entire Bible in 90 days. And for many of our members, it was an illuminating experience because while they had worked their way through the Bible sporadically, they had never started at Genesis and worked all the way through Revelation, and for many of them, it was a rite of passage. And for Pat, he came across a scripture passage that had to do with family that has now become his favorite scripture passage. And this is what Pat would read to Ellen on a regular basis. This is Proverbs chapter 25, verse 24. It is better to live in a corner of the housetop than in a house shared with a contentious wife. Now, of course, Ellen just automatically dismisses everything that Pat says. Their relationship is very much like my relationship with Shannon, but we're not the only people like this. Uh, Kay Burkholz is here today in the office, and as she said, it was better for her marriage every so often as she came up here to the church. So everybody is experiencing this sort of togetherness, which is both good, but also at times can be trying. I certainly know it is for Shannon, even though I would think being able cooped up with me for an extended period of time would be a blessing every once in a while, I'm certain she needs a break. In understanding the turmoil with family, what I decided to work with today is the very first family in history and how they got along or really how they didn't get along. So this morning's scripture reading is Genesis chapter 4 starting with verse 1 and going all the way through 16 and I hope you have your Bible with you if you would just please read along. <clears throat> now the man knew his wife Eve and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have produced a man with the help of the Lord. Next, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a tiller of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel, for his part, brought of the firstlings of his flock, their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. Cain said to his brother Abel, let us go out to the field. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground, and now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground... It will no longer yield you its strength. You will be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Today you have driven me away from the soil, and I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and anyone who meets me may kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. Whoever kills Cain will suffer a sevenfold vengeance. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, so that no one who came upon him would kill him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Now this is the first family conflict that we find in Scripture. And it has to do primarily with jealousy and sin and the capitulation to sin, but also God's grace in the midst of all of this. So, in order to put everything in its proper context, Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden. 
they decided that what they wanted was more important than what God wanted. They are expelled from Eden. But before this happens, God, in His gracious act, makes clothing for them, which is a sign of God's grace before they're sent out into the harsh environment of this world. <clears throat> they begin to have a family. First, Cain, who becomes a farmer, and then his little brother Abel, who is a shepherd. Now, any of you that are big brothers, you can identify with Cain. You never want a younger brother showing you up, but that's exactly what happens. Cain and Abel both make an offering to God. And what we know is Abel's offering is acceptable. Cain's is not. We're not told why this is the case. What most biblical scholars believe is that Abel offered God the very best he had Cain did not. Cain becomes very jealous. He becomes angry. And at this point, God comes to Cain and says again these words, Why are you angry? In other words, God says, You know this wasn't the best you could have done. Why are you angry about this? And why has your countenance fallen? And then there is the warning. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door. It's desires for you, but you must master it. Now, this is a continual theme through Scripture that sin is always present, and it certainly is for each of us. In fact, Peter says it like this. Discipline yourselves, keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary the devil prowls around looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Now, that's the key to all this. God is very clear with Cain. Sin is lurking at the door. Don't give in to this. We have the ability to say no to sin all the time. We don't have to give in. And yet over and over and over again, that's exactly what we do. And for those people who say, well, it's, it's not my fault, that's not true. My sins, my transgressions are my fault. Your sins, your transgressions ultimately are your fault. You do not have to to give in. You don't have to do those sorts of things. That's what Cain is saying. God is saying to Cain, you don't have to do this. Now, there are things in each of our lives that tempt us. It could be alcohol for some people, drugs for some people, pornography for some people, greed for some people, narcissism. It could be a bad relationship. Whatever it is, Cut it off. Get rid of it. Get it out of your life. Jesus is very clear about this. This is what he says. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go to hell. In other words, you don't have to do this. Whatever it is that leads you down the wrong road, just don't go there. And for those that say, well, I can't control where my mind goes, that's simply not true. You can. There are some areas that, quite frankly, are out of bounds. And the one thing that Scripture does is set limits, boundaries for our lives, so that our lives are healthy, that our lives are God-centered, and that our lives are led with a legitimate, holy purpose. Cain does give in to sin. He lures Abel out into the middle of nowhere, and when it's just the two of them, he attacks his brother, and he murders him. And he thinks that all is well. He returns home, and the first thing God says is, Cain, where's your brother? Now, in trying to dodge responsibility for what has happened, Cain says, I don't have a clue. A am I his keeper? Am I the one responsible for him? And at this point, God confronts Cain with the truth. And in essence, he says, I know exactly what you've done. 
your brother's blood is actually calling out to me, which has to do with the sacredness of life. Now what we believe is all life is sacred. All life is holy. It is God-given. And one thing that I know will be very controversial right now is that I hear people struggle with the reopening of the economy where some of our politicians are actually saying it's worth the risk to lose some people for financial gain. Now, friends, just remember, life is sacred in the eyes of God. And if it's sacred to God, then it has to be sacred to us. And we are to safeguard each other. Cain is confronted with the fact that he has sinned. And with sin, spelled from his family. And he is desperate. And in the midst of this, he cries out to God and he says, God... I'm going to be killed. No one will care for me. And now this is again the second time we see God's grace demonstrated in the midst of sin. It's the same for us today. God marks Cain, but for us, with sin, God is always here. And God is always working in our lives to bring us closer to Him. And when sin gets in the way, The prescription is very simple. And this is how John says it. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, He who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and clean us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His word is not in us. Now, some of you have heard me tell of this account before, but at my very first church, I preached on that scripture passage. And after I was done with the sermon, talking about how all of us are sinners, all of us are in need of God, transforming grace and forgiveness. When the service ended, I was standing at the doors of the sanctuary, greeting people as they were leaving the church, and up walked Ms. Betzer. Now, Ms. Betzer was probably only about four and a half feet tall. She was older than Methuselah. And she walked up to me and she put her finger up in my face and she said, Tom, you can call everybody else in this church a sinner, but you better never call me a sinner again. You know what I said? Yes, ma'am. That's because I was terrified of that little woman. I could have argued with scripture. I could have argued with theological reasoning. Instead, I just gave in because I was afraid of her. She couldn't handle the fact that she was in need of forgiveness. Now, friends, we all are. And that's why Jesus came. You have the opportunity for a new life, a life where you don't have to continually give in to sin, a life that is filled with light and hope because you know where you are going. Just accept. Now what we see in this story is conflict within family. God warning Cain, don't go down this road. You do not have to do this. Cain sinning anyways. The consequence of his sin, a murder, his expulsion. But also in the midst of this, we also see God's grace. You will encounter God's grace every day. No matter what's happening, you are not alone. So as you sit in your home, and God help you if you're sitting in a home with a bunch of teenagers, but if you're sitting in your home, just know, with your family, be patient, be kind, be gracious, use your words prudently, and be blessed. Thank you for being with me today. That is the good news and that is the gospel. Will you say amen? Amen. All done?